What they were, what were they told? Matthew twenty five six. Go back to the parable. Matthew twenty five six. And at midnight there was a cry made. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. The bridegroom cometh. Once again, it calls Jesus the bridegroom because he is the bridegroom. This is Jesus Christ coming back. They're, they're Christ, their Messiah, okay? This is God manifest in the flesh, their King, King of kings, Lord of lords. Once again, it calls Jesus the bridegroom. Where is the bride? Well, we come back with him. The bride comes back with Jesus Christ in Revelation 19. You can read that, okay? But Jude 1.14 this is in the Old Testament, Jude 1, 14, And Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. The Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. That's us. Revelation 5, 11 say, Those who suffer for Jesus Christ, those that are the silver and the gold, not the wood and the earth. Revelation 5, 11, and I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. That's what's up there in heaven. But that's not everyone that gets to come down. Those are everyone who's saved, which is such a small number. And I don't, I don't know if it's including the Old Testament saints, or it's just including the, the, day of the, um, the time of the Gentiles. From the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how he died for our sins, that's important. How he died for our sins, okay, was buried, rose again the third day, was buried and rose again the third day, um, to the catching away of the body of Christ. But when you read about Enoch, he says, but the people that get to come down with him and rule and reign with him, it's only around like 10,000. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are you suffering for Jesus Christ? Are you, in a lot of ways in your life, have you given in and started doing things the world's way? Okay. The world's way. It could be something simple. But it's, I, I always hit this up. And sisters in Christ, please understand, I love you. I'm saying this because I love you. What are the commands God gives on the appearance of a woman? What's the command God gives on the appearance of men? You have men that I believe could be saved, that they grow their hair out because they love long hair. But the Bible says it's a shame. The world says you have to do this to be accepted. The Bible says no, you got to do this to please God and be accepted of God. God says we're to have short hair, you cut your hair, the lost world makes fun of you, you're suffering because you're living for Jesus Christ. Women, how many, sisters of Christ, how many of you still wearing pants? I've had sisters of Christ that they, they, it's hard for them, they get the modest dresses, they start wearing the modest dresses and learning how to do things in modest dresses all the time. It's, it's a new experience because they're so used to having pants and doing everything. It's going to take a little bit more effort and a little bit more getting used to wearing modest dresses all the time. But the biggest thing is when the world comes, comes down on you, the feminists, oh, what are you doing wearing dresses all the time? What are you doing having long hair? What are you doing being a keeper at home? What are you doing being under a man's head covering? Don't you know you can be your own boss? Are you suffering for Jesus Christ doing things His way? Or are you compromising? Men and women, brothers and sisters in Christ, are you compromising a lot so that you're not really suffering for Jesus Christ at all? That's something really to think about, brothers and sisters Christ, really to think about. Revelation 19, this is where it is, Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Capital W Word. Verse 14, And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the right press of his fierce and fierceness of wrath and Almighty God. He opens his mouth, sword comes out, he wipes out the 200 million, 200 million man army. But you see, we come back with him. Now, I throw out some easy things, but there's a lot of things. How are you treating your brothers and sisters of Christ? Are you treating them according to the Word of God? Or are you starting to act like the world and treating them the way the world treats each other? 
How are you handling the scriptures? Are you being a good steward of the scriptures? And dealing with things the way God says to deal them. This is God's perfect written word. We don't add to it. We don't subtract from it. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is absolute truth, and I'm going to rightly divide. There's dispensations. Or are you starting to go with them? Oh, eh, we can add to the word of God here and there a little bit. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. I know a brother in Christ, he was trying to justify Trinity. Well, Trinity's not in the Bible. Well, Trinity's not in the Bible, but neither is rapture. Neither is uh, the millennial kingdom. See, we use a lot of words. He, his justification for adding to the scriptures when it comes to the Trinity was that we always add to the scriptures. That, that's not a good argument. That, that makes you look even worse. You're not supposed to add to the script. There is no millennial kingdom. It's day of the Lord, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. Not millennial kingdom. There is no millennial kingdom. Chapter and verse, millennial kingdom. Why can't you use what God said, the titles that God chose? There is no rapture. There's no such thing as a rapture in the King James Bible. We've already talked about this. Rapture is taken by violence, by force of a pleasing nature. Almost like bondage. Uh, no. When Jesus says, Philip Newton, come up hither... Praise God! We're going up. The Bible says caught up. Why can't we say it the Bible way? Because because snakes and serpents have come in like uh, and deceived church fathers, deceived brethren in the past, and they're just passing on these traditions where we add to the scriptures here, 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 here. Not everywhere, because you know what? A little bit don't hurt. We know when to quit. Who are you to judge me? It all depends on how you look at it. You know those excuses that the lost world uses to, to pervert the word of God, to justify sin? A little bit don't hurt. Yes, it does. We need to start stamping that out, brothers and Christ. Zero tolerance for adding to the word of God and subtracting from the word of God. I've got caught doing it. And when I get corrected, I have that attitude that I don't want to add to God's word and I don't want to subtract from God's word. And I've been corrected. But brother, sister Christ, are you suffering for Jesus Christ by standing for his word as it is, hiding it in your heart and living it and facing the consequences of everyone around you, whether it's your wife, whether it's your husband, whether it's your children, whether it's your family members, whether it's your co-workers, whether it's your neighbors, this world. Are you going to stand for this book no matter what? Or if you, or if, if you look in the mirror, do you look in the mirror and you see a man who's standing for God's word? Or when you look in the mirror, do you see a man or brother or sister in Christ that is compromised left and right? Most of the, profe the, the brethren professing Christians out there, they're nothing but, they're, they're fed this whole lie of compromise. You can still be a Christian and just compromise all you want. Technically, yes, but oftentimes... You're not saved. You never gave your life to Jesus Christ. There was no changed life. You never started out trying to live for Jesus Christ 100% and then failed. And then you're staying in that fallen position. A lot of them never were in a standing position to begin with. But I'm seeing a lot of brethren that are in a standing position. Now they're like this. Why? Because you keep compromising. The little things matter, brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the little things turn into big things. Brethren turning their back on the true plan of salvation. Brethren turning their back on what's God's perfect written word. Brethren turning their back on eternal security. Brethren turning their back on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away the body of Christ. Brethren turning their back on the Godhead of the King James Bible. Brethren turning their back on what the Bible says is sin. Instructions and in righteousness. The little things lead to the big things. Are you suffering for Jesus Christ? Where's the bride at? We're, we're in heaven being prepared for the bridegroom, or for the marriage supper of the Lamb, going through the judgment seat of Christ, and we get to come down, and we're coming down with them. And the virgins are going out to meet the Lord, and we're coming down with them. Now the ten virgins are called to what? Go ye out to meet Him. See, some people try to make these virgins out to be the body of Christ. Uh, no. Well, this is when we get caught up. The body of Christ, this is when we get caught up. No, it isn't. 
Go ye out to meet him. Go out to meet him. They're hiding in the wilderness and they're, they're leaving the wilderness to go out after Jesus wipes out that 200 million men army to meet him. The bride goes up to meet Jesus in the air. They go out and meet Jesus on the land. We go up and meet Jesus in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4.16, we'll read it again. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangels, and with the trump of God. Remember, trump is just the sound a trumpet makes. It's not an actual trumpet. It's the sound. It's the voice. When God says, Philip Newton, come up hither, it's going to have that, that, that echo and that tone of a trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort yourself with these words. We don't go through the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a comfort. But the important thing here is, is that the virgins are going out to meet the Lord. They're going out to meet the Lord. Not coming in, they're going out. Matthew 25, 7. So, here we read, back to the, the parable. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. There are two types of Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. Revelation 14.11 Revelation 14.11 And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have not rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. There's those who take the mark. Then you have Revelation 15, 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire there in the wilderness. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. There's two types of people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Those who don't take the mark and worship the beast and those that do. Let's keep reading. Matthew 25, 9, the parable of the, the virgins. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. We have to endure to the end just as you is what they're saying. We have to endure to the end just like you guys do. We took it seriously. You did not. Then they got victory over the beast versus those that worship the beast. We're, we're going to stay faithful and true. You guys are starting to miss the world. What's, what do they tell them? Matthew 25, 9. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Now, in that time period, how do you buy something in that time period? That no man, Revelation 13, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. They're told to go buy. If you don't like it here, go back there. Okay, we will. We'll just go back and enjoy it for a little bit, and when he does come back, then we'll come back and run out and meet him. <clears throat> An example of someone trying to follow God's commands and fails, okay? 1 Kings 13, 7. A great example of this. You have someone, them tell him, go out and buy. If you have to, go out and buy. We're not giving you our oil. We're enduring our endurance. We're enduring to the end. We all have to endure to the end. I'm not giving you my oil. If you want some oil, go and buy. Now in that time period, what is it? Revelation 13, 17 says, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast. You're not to take the mark and worship the beast. 1 Kings 13, 7, we read, There's a prophet that God says, Hey, I need you to go in a certain way and come out a certain way, and I need you to say these words to this king, and I don't want you, you're not allowed to eat anything or drink anything in that place. These are commands. You go in one way, you come out the other, and you don't eat anything or drink anything in that place. And here's where we read in 13.7, And the king said unto a man of, the man of God, Come home with me and refuse thyself, and I will give thee a reward. And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, 
nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. You can give me all the world. I, I just want Jesus and his word. I want to please God. I want to earn rewards in heaven. Okay, I'm just going to suffer for Jesus Christ. I fear God. I love God. He's what matters. What happens? Jump, uh, 1 Kings 13, you jump down to fifth, uh, chapter 13, verse 15. We read, Then he said unto him, another prophet comes along and starts talking to the main prophet of the story that said, You can give me the whole kingdom, and I will not turn against God's word. He said, I'm not to do this. I'm not doing it. In the time of Jacob's trouble, you're not to take the mark and worship the beast. God says this. You're going to have Moses and Elijah, the two witnesses, preaching that you don't take the mark and you don't worship the beast. God said not to. I'm not going to. But then another prophet comes along. Uh, what, what, is there a prophet in the time of Jacob's trouble that's called the false prophet? Yeah. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He, this is the, this, it doesn't call him the false prophet, but think of the false prophet in the time of Jacob's trouble. No, 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 you can still take the mark and worship the beast. All you have to do is cut off your arm when the time comes arm. Cut off your hand when the time comes. Pluck out your eye, the, the chip that goes in the forehead, and all of a sudden it's the eye, but it's supposed to be the forehead, but it's the eye. You have these false prophets. No, 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 you can still take the mark and be saved. Listen to this guy. He said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee unto thine house, that, they, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. The false prophet, he's called the false prophet in the time of Jacob's trouble because he's a liar. He's lying to people. He's damning a lot of people to hell by getting them to take the mark and worship the beast when the time comes. I don't know exactly when that gets implemented, but it doesn't get implemented at the very beginning. You have the Jews that are in Jerusalem having to flee, so the mark of the beast hasn't been implemented. I, I honestly believe the mark of the beast system won't be implemented until like around three and a half years into the time of Jacob's trouble. And then within the last six months, maybe a year, but six months, that's when Mystery Babylon's destroyed. It's just the timetable, okay? But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat bread in his house and drank water. And you read the story about it. He went out and got mauled by a lion and killed because he didn't keep the commandments of God. In that time period, you think people aren't going to get deceived into taking? There's people that are going to take the mark and worship the beast willingly. Then you're going to have people that reject it at first, but then get deceived into taking it. Oh, yeah. Okay. God gives a command. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Don't do it. Don't go buy and sell. In order to buy and sell, you have to take the mark and worship the beast. God is taking care of the Jews that are running into the wilderness, like he did the Jews that came out of Egypt. Remember what we talked about Egypt? Okay, They come out of Egypt. The moment they run out of water, they start whining and complaining about how the hard it is, and it was so much easier in Egypt, and we had it better in Egypt. All right. Then <clears throat> they ran out of food. Then they start whining and complaining of how much better they had it in Egypt, the, the type of the world. When we were in the world and of the world, we had it so much easier. God gave them water. They, I don't really think they thanked him that well. Then God gave them food, gave them manna, rained manna bread from heaven. Then they started whining and complaining because they didn't have meat. The world, they just kept whining and complaining about how great the world was, how great Egypt was. Yeah, we were slaves. Yeah, it seemed like we were doomed to destruction. But you know what? We still had it better. You think that kind of deception doesn't go on today? There's brethren that get into that. <clears throat> that are deceived by that kind of talk. Yeah, the world's not that bad. No, the world isn't that bad. We can, you know, we, we can compromise a little bit. I mean, come on. Why do you think so many brethren are falling flat on their face today? 
The world is so wicked. You can't compromise. You can't give an inch. It'll take a mile. You give the flesh an inch, it'll take a mile. You give the world an inch, it'll take a mile. You give Satan an inch, he'll try to take it all. You can't give an inch. You can't compromise. Okay? Today, God can get you back up on your feet. You fail the Lord, you compromise, you fail the Lord. God can get you back up on your feet. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, you compromise. You take that mark and you worship the beast just to get some food, just to have some a warm place to stay the night a few nights, and then think you can go back out into that wilderness? Doesn't work. Doesn't work. You compromise then, you're doomed. You're done for. God will not let you, you, you didn't endure to the end, therefore you will never get saved. Matthew 25, 11, go back to the um, parable of, of the ten virgins. Matthew, chapter, Matthew 25, 11. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, okay, they went back to the world, they, they had to buy oil, and when you have to buy something in that time period, what do you have to do? You have to take the mark and worship the beast. They took the mark, worshiped the beast, bought, let's say it's just they went in town just enough to take the mark, worship the beast for 10 minutes so they could grab some supplies so they can run back out into the wilderness. Doesn't matter. Did you take the mark? Did you worship the beast? Afterwards came also the other virgin saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. I know you not. Yeah, but we're Jews. Doesn't matter. Oh, come on, Lord. Doesn't matter. Well, yeah, we took the mark and worshiped the beast a little bit, but we needed provisions because we didn't prepare and we didn't take the time of Jacob's trouble seriously. Sorry, don't know you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, we read, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. By their fruits. Right. Remember, in the time of, this also, in the time of Jacob's trouble, uh, it's not just that I didn't take the mark or worship the beast, therefore I can get saved. There's two parts to salvation then. You have to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins and believe that they crucified their king, that Jesus died for their sins, was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures, and that Jesus is coming back. It's twofold. And don't take the mark and worship the beast. You have to do both. There'll be, there might be some people that don't take the mark and don't worship the beast, but they never, they never accepted the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. They rejected the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. Do you ever stop to think of that? Okay. Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Enter. It's not talking about heaven. Heaven. It's talking about the physical kingdom. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven doeth works. Don't take the mark. Don't worship the beast. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now stop right there. You know what this reminds me of, brothers and Christ? It reminds me of Samuel and Saul. Remember when Saul was commanded by God to go out and kill King Haggai? And all his people were so wicked and so vile, they, they have... They have perverted the children, they perverted, everyone's perverted, the animals are perverted. They were told, to, he was told to go slaughter them all. You don't want any of that perversion that's going on over there to come back to the people. But he was given a command, you're to take them all out. They didn't kill King Hagag, Saul didn't kill King Hagag, and they kept the best, what looked like the best animals. In our eyes, it can look like the best animals, but in God's eyes, they're abomination that they've been defiled in any way, shape, or form, whether to for false gods or sexual perversion. If those people and those animals have been defiled, they've been defiled. But they took what they saw, because they didn't see how God sees, the best of the animals, the best of the sheep, and the best of the oxen, and when Samuel came to confront him, Saul kept saying, I did obey the Lord. I did. We kept the best of the sheep and the oxen and everything to sacrifice unto the Lord. 
You have all these people that are saying, well, didn't we do this for you, Lord? Didn't we do that for you, Lord? What did Saul say? Because God was speaking through Saul. He was a prophet. To Samuel. He said that God, does God have more, does God love offerings and gifts more than he loves being obedient to the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. They're saying, look at all these things we did for you, Lord. And God's like, but what did I tell you not to do? Today you have, uh, just for instruction and righteousness, for today you have brethren out there that says, look at all these things I do for the Lord. But what did God tell you to do? Something to think about, brothers and sisters Christ. I'm, I'm sorry I'm raising my voice. I'm not raising it at you. I'm talking about mainly these professing Christians. The false converts out there. Because that's what this is talking about. The false converts out there. Look at all this. I, I, I wear my Sunday best. I go to the Babel buildings. And I sing all these hymns for you, Lord. And, and I, I go around and I give money to the poor. And I do this for you, Lord. But they're not doing what God commanded them to do. A lot of what they're doing has no basis in Scripture. Brothers and Christ, you can fall into the same trap when you start compromising. Yeah, but I did this for the Lord, and I did that for the Lord. But are you doing what God commanded you to do? By their fruits you shall know them. And their fruits need to line up with this book, the King James Bible, God's perfect written word. Your works, your fruits need to line up with the Scriptures. Rightly dividing. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Saul had a hard heart. Yeah, I'm doing the work of the Lord. Yeah, I'm serving the Lord in my own way, doing it my way. You think you're going to have those types of people in the time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah, I'm still serving the Lord in my own way. Yeah, I can still take the mark and worship the beast. Why? Because I'm sealed into the day of redemption. Not in that time period, you're not. There's only one seal in that time period, and that's for the Jews. The 144,000 Jews. That's it. But there are people that are going to be deceived by false prophets. Oh, yeah, you can still take the mark. You can still worship the beast. Oh, you can just cut your hand off and gouge out your eye or whatever. Pluck your eye out. For 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth the sayings of mine, heareth the sayings of mine, and doeth them not, and doeth them, I'm sorry, heareth the sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And then he likens the man that didn't do what he said to a man who built a house on sand. And he goes into more parables. The commandment of God is more important than you doing all these. Saying, I'm doing this for the Lord and I'm doing that for I'm celebrating Christmas for the Lord. Is that what God commanded you to do? God commanded you to stay away from idols. Pagan religions. And all kinds of other things that we talked about. But I'm doing it for the Lord. How many times have you heard people say that? They put a rubber Jesus stamp on something and say, now it's Christian, now it's holy all of a sudden, and it's okay. People got on to me when I got on to them about the Jesus fish. I said, that's not of Jesus. That's a false Egyptian God symbol. Just because you put a little cross for an eye doesn't make it all of a sudden it's good and it's okay. But how many people say they put those stickers on their car for Jesus Christ? I'm doing it for Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and goes, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye accursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? Because the word of God wasn't their foundation. It was the world. They did not get saved God's way. They didn't come to him God's way. You have brethren that are fallen. You compromise. Well, maybe a little bit won't hurt. Yeah, God will forgive me. Then you start trying to talk yourself out of conviction. It all depends on how you look at it. These versions went out to buy. Okay, you have the five versions that went out to buy. These are Jews that went out to buy. And how do you buy? You have to take the mark and worship the beast. 
Sometimes I always wonder how these Jews will act when Jesus comes marching into the city. Okay, How these Jews, some that probably didn't take the mark and didn't worship the beast, but they didn't accept the kingdom of heaven. They rejected Jesus Christ as their king, the kingdom of heaven. You'll have Jews that took the mark and worshiped the beast. How will these people act when Jesus comes triumphantly marching into the city? Quick, quick! No, they won't be doing that. Cut off your hand! No. What some of them might do is try to be like, just think, they're sitting there, they're looking around. Uh-oh, we were wrong. Uh-oh, we didn't obey Moses and Elijah. In fact, we had him beheaded. Uh-oh. Um, um, where's some palm leaves? Hosanna in the highest! Hosanna in the highest! And God just, Jesus Christ just looks at him and goes, Depart from me, you curse and everlasting fire. Prepare for the devil and his angels. I never knew you. They're going to be desperate. Jesus is triumphant, marching. Our Lord and our Savior is triumphant, marching into the city. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. This is the ultimate seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. God knows who are real and who are fake. They're not going to be able to, no one's going to be deceiving God today. Nobody deceived God in the past. No one's going to deceive God today. They think they are. Okay? Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever thou soweth, thou shalt ye also reap. There's people today who think they're deceiving God. I get to go to heaven. I deceive God. God knows them that are His. Today, Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. In the time of Jacob's trouble, Revelation chapter 7, verse 3, it says, Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. The Jewish people. Revelation 9.4, we also read, And it was commanded then that they should not hurt the grass on the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. There is a seal in the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's not, uh, it's not a seal until the day of redemption, for, like it is today. And it's not for saved sinners, as far as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. In that time period, you're going to have Jews that are sealed in their forehead, and, if you don't, and those are what God chooses. And those that have those seals, God's going to be taking care of them. And there's going to be other Jews with them that I believe are going to make it through that don't have that seal. Did they make it through believing in the, the, the gospel, which is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven gospel, and not taking the mark and worshiping the beast? Galatians 6, 7, As the Lord our God be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever thou soweth, thou shalt ye also reap. That's the bottom line. God is not mocked. God knows them that are His. He looks at those five... Uh, virgins and says, I never knew you. Why? Because you had to endure to the end and then ye shall be saved. Then you get saved. You're not saved and then you lose the salvation. I was wrong in saying that. You are not saved, period, in that time of Jacob's trouble until, you're, until the end. Whether it's in death, being beheaded for the, like I said, being beheaded for the testimony of Jesus Christ and the witness for the witness and testimony of Jesus Christ and His commandment. Don't take the mark, don't, take, don't worship the beast. Or you, don't, you make it to the very end where they don't catch you and behead you. Okay. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. One of the biggest things that they get in here that I wanted to touch on real quick at the end as we end this, this uh, expository study is Revelation or Matthew chapter 22, 1 through 13. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God, not the spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, the physical kingdom, is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son. The marriage supper of the Lamb that we're just reading about. They're going out, the, the virgins are going out to meet him. So they can start the marriage supper of the land, the marriage ceremony. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come, the Jewish people. At first, they wouldn't come. 
Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, and my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready, come unto the marriage. The Jewish people that hadn't lost that inheritance. Remember you have the Samaritans that lost their inheritance. You have the Jewish people. It's not for the Gentiles. It's not for the Samaritans. It's only for the Jews that still have that inheritance. They haven't lost it yet. They're going out and he's bidding them, come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and treated them spitefully and, and slew them, the prophets in the Old Testament. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their cities. In the Old Testament, he allowed Nebuchadnezzar to come in and destroy the holy city. He allowed, uh, I think it was 60 or so, between 60 and 70 AD, he allowed people to come in there and destroy the temple and destroy the city again. He's going to allow the uh, man of sin, the son of perdition, to go in there. Then he said unto his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which are bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Salvation goes out into the world. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. I'm sorry, these are guests. This is not, this is not talking about us. I had it wrong. It's talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to go to the time of Jacob's trouble. Times of Jacob's trouble. He's going to be preaching the kingdom of heaven again. He's going to open it up when he guests for the marriage supper. We've got the bride, the Gentiles. We've got the bride, predominantly Gentiles, but there's going to be Jews. Uh, but the time of uh, the Gentiles between the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. That's the bride. But now we need guests. We need guests. Okay. So he's saying. The Jews, that I, when the first time he came, Jesus came, remember, John the Baptist preached the kingdom of heaven. Repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then Jesus started preaching it. Then the apostles were to preach it, and they weren't to preach it to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, the Jews that lost the inheritance. Those were, he's talking about, he went and utterly destroyed them. Now, in the time of Jacob's trouble, he's offering it again to the Jews. Those Jews in that generation didn't want it. They got destroyed. Now he's going to the time of Jacob's trouble and he's offering it to the Jews again. We need guests. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there was a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, and here's a key word there, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Okay. He was speechless. Then said the king to the servant, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And some people say, Well, this is Satan. This is talking about Satan. Satan's there. Because remember, I, I, I don't have it all perfectly planned, that, or like timeline-wise, but you have Jesus. He comes down. He wipes out the 200 man, million man, 200 million man army that goes out to fight him. Then you have the Jews from the wilderness coming out to meet him, and then we're all coming into the city. The saints, the army that comes back with them, the Jews that were in the wilderness, we're coming back into the city. That's where you have Satan. That's where you have the false prophet and the beast. You've got those three people, those, those three there. The true trinity. They're there. Okay. And they say, well, this is talking about Satan, and it can't be before the time of Jacob's trouble, I mean, it can't be before the day of the Lord, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, because Satan doesn't get cast into the lake of fire where there's wailing, never says there's gnashing of teeth, weeping and gnashing of teeth. And if you look at parallels on it, that's talking about uh, hell. Uh, uh, um, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Uh, there's other verses where Jesus says, cast them into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, Revelation 21, chapter 20, verse 1, this is what happens to Satan when Jesus comes into the city. We're doing the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there's Satan standing there. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and great chains in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, 
that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, and he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed for a season. He gets tossed into the bottom of this pit. Who knows if there's wailing and gnashing of teeth in the bottom of this pit? It's outer darkness. Could that be what this is talking about? I don't think so, but some people believe it's talking about Satan. At the end, the reason get people, people get it for the, at the end of the day of the Lord, we don't, get the, we don't have the marriage supper of the Lamb until the end of the day of the Lord, the end of the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Because in Revelation 27 we read, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is of the sands of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven, and devoured them. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. People say, see, there's the wailing and gnashing of teeth. They're getting tossed into the lake of fire. So that has to be it. But how do we know what it's going to be like in the bottomless pit? I believe that the marriage supper of the Lamb happens before, before. It's part of the transition going into the day of the Lord. It happens as we go into the city. We have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ officially starts. Okay. Okay, there's also a big divide on whether the marriage supper of the Lamb happens before the day of the Lord or after. There's a divide among the brethren. I believe it happens before because the Jews that are in the wilderness go to meet the Lord to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. There's some argument that we have the marriage supper of the Lamb when we go up, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. No, 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 no. I don't believe it happens then. I believe we're being prepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb. What's that? We're going through the judgment seat of Christ. For that seven years, the, body, the bride of Christ is going through the judgment seat of Christ. And we get to watch what's going on down here. Okay? The actual marriage supper of the Lamb happens down here before the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ officially starts. Okay? Revelation 19.20 Here's something people don't really talk about. When Jesus comes back and he starts marching into the city... That person that's there without a wedding garment? What about the beast and the false prophet? They kind of get forgotten. Revelation 19.20 And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him. This is, we're doing the marriage supper of the Lamb. And here are these false prophet and the beast. Could it be them? Before him, which with, with which he deceived, I'm sorry, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. They were deceived. These both were cast alive in the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Cast them into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Could this man that has no garment be those two, be a, a, a representation of those two? They don't have a wedding garment. They're not part of the marriage supper. They're not, they're definitely not the, the bridegroom, but they're not the bride and they're not the virgins. Those five virgins that went in, they're not those people. They get cast out. Uh, Revelation 24, we read, And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judged Judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received the mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. They were, for a thousand years. These are people that are going to be there, and they're going to have a wedding garment. Okay? So another thing that I talk about is the wedding garment. Could it be that, like I said, you have people that make it to the end without taking the mark and worshiping the beast, but they never believed in the kingdom of heaven. They never repented and believed in what Jesus Christ did and who he was, their king. So you got these people that are there, 
They endure to the end without taking the mark and worshiping the beast. But they don't have a wedding garment on. They're not part of those five virgins that went in. You have the five virgins that God said, Depart from me, I never knew you. Could those five virgins that try to show up and say, Okay, we're ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. He looks at them and goes, Where's your wedding garment? Could that be what's going on? Okay. Back to, back to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Let's finish this up. Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 13. Watch, therefore. See, today we're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope. We are supposed to be looking for Jesus to come back in the clouds to call, call us up in the air. In the time of Jacob's trouble, they're supposed to watch, therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. And one of the biggest things I've got to push here is that's not for today. You have so many brethren that try to grab that today and try to make something up like, no man knoweth the year? It says we don't know the day or the hour, but no man knoweth the year? And they're trying to apply that today for the catching away of the body of Christ. This is not for the catching away of the body of Christ. This is for the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble when waiting for Jesus Christ to come back at the end. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Those five fullest virgins decided to give in and go buy things, go buy oil. Go back to the world for a little bit. That's what I believe. They weren't prepared for Jesus Christ to come back. So warning for the Jews that go through the time of Jacob's trouble, not for today. The people in the time of Jacob's trouble will be looking for Jesus to return and start the kingdom of heaven, also called the day of the Lord, also called the kingdom of God. It is a warning to be prepared and have the right foundation. It's not enough just to endure to the end as far as uh, not taking the mark of worship and the beast. You also have to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And will there be there people there at the beginning of the marriage supper of the Lamb where there will be people that don't have a wedding garment. They don't have the testimony of Jesus Christ. They didn't take the mark. They didn't worship the beast. But they don't have that testimony of Jesus Christ. Where's your wedding garment? Matthew 25, 14. Matthew 25, 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. It goes into another parable about the kingdom of heaven. The body of Christ leaves. The time of the Gentiles end. The clock starts the Jewish people. The time of Jacob's trouble. Halfway into the time of Jacob's trouble, that's where we're getting this parable about the, the ten virgins. They're fleeing to the wilderness. They're going out to meet him, and they have to rest a little while. Three and a half years, they're out there, living a very hard life. Brother, sister Christ, who are those, those ten virgins? I believe it's a representation of the Jewish people. God goes back to dealing with the Jewish people. Paul said blindness in part has happened to the Jewish people. God hasn't done away with his people. He's going to go back to dealing with them in the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob's another word for Israel. Those ten virgins are Jews. Another question that was asked, that, did they lose their salvation? Uh, they can't lose something they never had. In that time period, you're not saved until you make it to the very end and, the, and God opens the door and lets you in. Those five virgins went in. Then they were saved. They weren't saved before at all. You don't have that seal like we have today. Okay? You don't. You have to endure to the end in order to be saved. In order to, then thou shalt be saved. You have to endure to the end, and then you have to have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You endure to the end, you have the testimony of Jesus Christ, then thou shalt be saved. Those five virgins weren't saved to begin with. You don't get saved to the end. They didn't endure to the end. They failed. They failed miserably. Now here's the good news, Brother Sister Christ, for us. Hopefully you learned a lot in that parable. For us, Brother Sister Christ, here's the good news. The body of Christ doesn't have to go through that time period. We don't. Okay. 
We are not looking for Jesus to come back to start the day of the Lord. We are looking for Jesus to come in the clouds to take his bride home so we can start the judgment seat of Christ. That's what we're looking for. And in the next passage, when it talks about how we get caught up, where at all in the Pauline epistles are we being told to avoid the mark of the beast and worshiping him? We're never warned about that today in the time of the Gentiles, which is called the Bride of Christ, the church age. Some people call it the church age, but it's, it's the body of Christ. Those that are in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that time period, you're not in, in the time of Jacob's trouble, you're not in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have a testimony of Jesus Christ. And you've got to endure to the end in order to be saved. Before God will save you, you've got to endure to the end and you've got to keep that testimony clear to the end. Titus 2.12, Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Not the time of Jacob's trouble, today. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to the catching away of the body of Christ. The time of the Gentiles, this present world. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We get to come back, some of us will get to come back with them in the time of Jacob's, uh, the day of the Lord, to rule and reign with him. Zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority, let no man despise thee. Where is it to warn us about having to endure to the end to be saved? Where are we being told to watch out, don't take the mark, don't, don't worship the beast? We're looking for that blessed hope, the great appearing of our great God and Savior, but nowhere does it say we have to endure to the end. Jesus will come in the clouds, but he won't touch down. We go up to meet him in the air. Then here we're reading the parable of the uh, ten virgins. Jesus actually comes down and touches down. It's two different events. People try to make it out to be the same event. It's two different events. Brothers is Christ, the number one thing that we should get from that parable is that we won't be going through that time period where you have to endure to the end before God will save you. 1 Thessalonians 4.17 Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Remember what it said there? Let uh, these things speak and exhort, talking about looking for that blessed hope. Living every day as if Jesus Christ could come back tomorrow. That's a good thing. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. I rebuke the brethren that have turned their backs on the eminent return of Jesus Christ. I rebuke you and the, by the word of God. I exhort the brethren who have stood firm and stand strong for the word of God by looking for that blessed hope. Living a life of Christ every day as if he could come back tomorrow. And I'm going to try to keep encouraging you, encouraging you to keep living for Jesus Christ. To keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. We could get caught up any day now. Any day now. And my rebuke to the brethren who have fallen and turned their back on the imminent return of Jesus Christ, it's not to destroy you, it's to get you back in a standing position. You don't want to be in a fallen position when Jesus comes back. You know. And I will continue to speak these things. And I pray the other men in ministry that still stand for them in the return of Jesus Christ continues to speak these things. Okay? Teaching us, deny, speaking, denying ungodliness, denying worldly lust, live soberly, live righteously, live godly, God's way in this present world. Always keeping your eyes, looking for that blessed hope, always keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep speaking these things, brothers and sisters of Christ. Keep speaking these things. What's important for us is that we will not have to go through that time period, brethren. We should be... What should be important to the lost world in this study, if someone comes across this study that's lost, is that you don't have to go through that time period. But if you reject Jesus Christ, you will go through that time period. 
And it's going to be the worst time period in history, and it's no longer about the Gentiles, it's about the Jews. Salvation goes back to being of the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. What is important to us, brothers and sisters, is not, is not, what's important to us is not taking the mark of worshiping the beast. What's important to us is not looking for the man of sin, the son of perdition, the, the beast. We're not supposed to be looking for him. We're not supposed to be looking for that mark or the, the, the mark in worshiping the beast that goes hand in hand. We're not supposed to be looking for the worldwide economic collapse. We're not supposed to be looking for the one world order. What are we supposed to be looking for, Jesus, brothers and sisters of Christ? We're supposed to be looking for Jesus Christ to come back. Now, we can see signs in the world as we're having to live in this world saying, hey, it's getting worse out there, it's getting worse out there. We see how it's getting closer to the time of Jacob's trouble. But we're not supposed to be hardcore fixed on looking for the time of Jacob's trouble to the point where we start acting like we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. I know brethren out there who have. It's all about, well, we got to stock up and endure to the end. We're not supposed to be acting like we're going through the time of Jacob's trouble. We're supposed to trust the Lord. Yes, we're supposed to work. Yes, there's nothing wrong with being self-sufficient. That's actually a good thing today. Learning to grow food, learning to hunt, learning to fish, learning to can food. Learning to take care of yourself where you're not dependent on the world. Trust God. Absolutely. But we're not supposed to have that. We've got to endure to the end mentality. And some of the brethren are starting to get that mentality. They're taking their eyes off Jesus Christ and they're putting it on the world. And they're starting to have that mentality. We're not looking for those things, brothers and Christ. We're looking for Jesus Christ to come back with the life that we're living. We're, part of the, we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. We're part of the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be a light into this world with the life that we're living and with our words. We're to lead as many people to Christ as we possibly can before we get caught up in that time of Jacob's trouble starts. That's what we're supposed to be doing. Pleasing God every day today. Not preparing to go through such hard times that, like the time of Jacob's trouble. The lost world, if you're lost, you do not want to go into this time period. And the brother says, Christ, we need to be pushing this. You need to get saved today so you don't have to go into that time period. A, so you don't go to hell. And B, that you don't go into that time period. Your sins are sending you to hell. And the catch away the body Christ is coming soon. The easiest time in the world to get saved is right now. 2 Corinthians 6.2. How many of you know this one? 2 Corinthians 6.2. This is where we're going to wrap it up. For he saith, I have heard thee in the accepted time. In the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Get saved today, brothers and sisters of Christ. We need to get out there and get people to get saved today. And if you are saved today, get your heart right with the Lord. Get, it, get your life straight with the Lord. Get your life lined up with this book. We're going to get caught away at any time, any day now. We can get caught home. Are you ready? Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next study.